Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing? Um, let me pray, and then we will jump into it, okay? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, thank you for loving us so much. You sent your only begotten son to be our savior. We don't take it lightly. And God, I pray today, give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see. Give us a heart to receive the truth of who Jesus is and why the gory, bloody details. We thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody that agreed said, amen. amen. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about why the gory, bloody details. Why the cross? Why did Jesus have to come to the planet he made and die on a cross? And why did it have to be so gruesome? And why the blood? Like, why was that all significant? More than significant, essential. We're going to kind of walk through the process, and I want to tell you a story in the midst of it, how it came to be that I understood it this way, okay? So let me give you a little history. Years ago, uh, when I first became a Christian, some of you might think back to when you first became a Christian. So prior to being a Christian, for me, I was a good person. I went to church fairly regularly. I was, I was a good person. And I roomed with a, a friend of mine in college. We'd been friends since third grade. She'd become a born-again Christian, and she was, like, totally into Jesus. And I was like, I'm a good person. I'm good. I'm glad you're into Jesus. I'm just, like, good, you know. We roomed together, and she began to share things with me about Jesus about the gospel, about salvation, about my need to, you know, repent and receive Jesus. And she was never mean about it. She was just truthful. She was never like, you know, like in my face. She was just truthful. And who knows that sometimes the truth feels mean <laughs> and it feels like they're in your face, but it's actually just the truth. So she's telling me the truth and I'm thinking, but I'm a good person. I mean, I'm not like Adolf Hitler. I'm not like Charlie Manson. I mean, you know, certainly I've gotten a C plus if God's, you know, grading. So anyways, I was just thinking those thoughts. However, even since I was about six years old as a kid, I remember this. I distinctly remember this. As a six-year-old kid, I remember coming, I was in sleep, you know, trying to sleep, and I came out from my bedroom, and I came out to find my parents, and I told my mom and dad I was crying, and they said, what's the matter? And I said, I'm afraid to die. Like, I distinctly remember as a six-year-old being aware of death, being aware that this would be a thing. Now, the reason I even had any concept of death at such a young age was because my uh, cousin, I had a little cousin who was three, who, who was run over by a car, and he passed away. And so that was on my mind as a little kid. And I just, you know, I thought about eternity and like, okay, where do people go? And where do they go for eternity? And like, I just I had all these thoughts. And so I was concerned about like, how do you know for sure you go to heaven? I don't know. I guess just be a good person. That's kind of what I knew. My roommate's talking to me about Jesus. She's telling me all these things. And I kind of gave her the stiff arm because I didn't really want to deal with it. At the time, I was 19 years old, freshman in college. Man, I want to live life. I want to party. I don't want to talk about Jesus right now. So I kind of gave her the stiff arm. But meanwhile, God's working in my heart. So unbeknownst to her, I decided, well, maybe I should read the Bible and see if what she's telling me is true. Up until this point, I'd really never read the Bible. I think I tried once. I thought, okay, I'll start in Genesis. You know, by Genesis chapter 2, I was asleep. And um, never got back to it. <laughs> I was busy. <laughs> so I decided at this point, I think I'll start reading the Bible. So I, underneath my chemistry book, I had a New Testament, and I started reading the New Testament. I didn't tell her. I started reading the New Testament. And I didn't read the Gospels because, see, I was raised going to church. I went to church every week, pretty much. And so I knew the Gospels. I mean, I'd heard those stories but I was going to read something I hadn't heard, or at least didn't think I'd heard much about. So I decided to start in the book of Romans. I decided to start my Bible reading journey in the book of Romans, which is an amazing book. 
I'm reading Romans, and as I'm reading, I distinctly remember I'm laying on our red couch in the family room, living with my mother and my sisters, and I'm laying on the red couch reading Romans. And I'm reading it, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I'm a sinner. I am a sinner. I am unrighteous. I need a Savior. Like, it hit me for the first time ever. See, up until that point, I knew I had sinned, but I was a good person. But reading the Bible that day, I realized, oh, my gosh, I am a sinner. Like, I am lost. Like, I'm separated from God. Like, I'm not righteous. Like, I need rescuing. I need a Savior. Like, it, it hit me. See, before, my roommate's trying to witness to me, and I'm giving her the stiff arm. I'm good. I'm good. Jesus for you. I'm good. Now, all of a sudden, something in my heart's changing because I recognize who I really am in God's view. He loves me. I know he loves me, but I also know my condition is I'm a sinner. And now there's no stiff arm. Now it's like, how fast can I run to get to Jesus? Amen. It really does start with a recognition that we are sinners separated from a loving God. Not because God's mad at us, not because God doesn't like us. It's just truth. And all the people said. Amen. So with that then, I came to Christ. I invited Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I became a Christian. Everything changed. I didn't feel goosebumps. I didn't hear angels sing. But everything changed inside. I'm reading Romans. And I kept reading. Now, my calling verse later, a couple of years later, turns out it was Romans chapter 10. But as I'm reading Romans, I'm like, people need to know this. Oh, my gosh, this is so amazing. Like, this is amazing. Do people know this? People need to know this. And, of course, the first group I'm thinking of is my family. I'm thinking of my mom and my stepdad, my dad and my stepmom, I'm thinking of all of my sisters, three sisters, and then a couple of them were engaged, so they're husbands-to-be. I'm thinking of my family. I'm like, Lord, I've got to tell this to my family because I don't want to get to heaven. I don't want to be saved and get to heaven, and then they're not there. I want my whole family to be saved. And I began to pray every night in my journal. I would journal just about every night, and I would always put in there, Lord, I pray. I'm praying for my family. They're the, I want to get to everybody else in the world because you told us to, but I want to start with my family. And I started to pray, God, I just pray for every blood, step, and in-law relative. Began to pray that they'd get opened up to eternity, opened up to their condition before God. Just praying, praying, and in the process, thankfully, in my immediate family, within two years, everyone in my immediate family, my dad, my stepmom, my mom, my stepdad, all of my sisters, and a couple of brothers-in-laws all got saved within two years, within a short window. I was passionate about it, and I wasn't going to leave witnessing to them to someone else. Now, somebody else could come along, great. But I felt, uh, I felt a burden. I want to make sure that my family knew that they heard it from me. I told them what I knew, which wasn't a whole lot, but I knew enough. And so I had individual, you know, get-togethers with each one. Some received it better than others at first. One of my sisters at the time, it's funny because, like, she's a missionary now. She's like, Beth, you're ruining our family name. I'm like, we don't even have a family name. What are you saying? So you get a little persecution, but they all came to the Lord. So then I began to, you know, write letters to and try to somehow communicate to blood step and in-law relatives. I'm thinking, okay, my cousins, I love my cousins and other family members. So I began to write letters to different cousins. And I had one cousin I was writing to, I wrote her a letter and I was just doing my best to try to explain, you know, being a Christian, being saved, what had happened in my life, you know, reading Romans. I tried to explain it to her the best I could in, you know, my lay language. And I sent her the letter and then she wrote back and she said, okay, I got your letter. And I just have a couple of questions. She said, well, if God is so loving and if God is so forgiving and if God is so good, how could he crucify, how could he murder his own son? Why the gory, bloody 
details. That was her question. And when I read the letter, I was like, whoa. I was kind of like, whoa, on a couple of accounts. First, I was like, yes, she's asking great questions. Like, these are great questions. It means she's thought about it. So I took that as a good sign. But then I was also like, whoa, how do I answer her? Like, I sort of knew the answer, but I didn't fully know. Like, why the gory, bloody details? Why did Jesus have to come to the planet he made? Why did he have to die on a cross? Why did it have to be a crucifixion? Why so much blood? Like, why did it have to be that way? I thought it was a great question. So I began to pray. I said, Lord, help me help her. Help me to understand it first, like better than I do, and help me to write her a letter to, to send it back to her. So I just, I literally had a prayer time, I, a, quite a lengthy prayer time. I literally just knelt by my bed, and I just said, okay, Holy Spirit, help me understand this. Like, here's what I know. And I started with what I knew, and then I asked him to help clarify it. So I'm going to take you on that journey, what he began to tell me. And you might remember last week, I shared a message last week on um, how to run in 2021, how to run with God. And we talked about doing four things. We talked about stop, look, listen, and write, remember? And I realized when I look back on this storm, like, that, that was that. That's exactly what happened. I stopped. I looked within, like in my spirit, I'm like, okay, Lord, help me to understand. I mean, there's some things I know, but there's a lot I don't know. Stop. Look. Listen. I asked him questions. Listen. And then write. I wrote it down. I wrote it down in a letter to her. And then eventually, a number of years later, I wrote a little book called Why the Gory Bloody Details. And in fact, we found, just a couple of months ago, we found the audio book. I recorded it. I don't even remember recording it, but I recorded it 10 years ago or more. And we have the audiobook of why the gory, bloody details that I don't think we ever released. I listened to it. I'm like, what? It's got an official narrator at the beginning. And it's the audiobook of that little book, the gory, bloody details. And so listen, this week, Good Friday's coming up, Easter next week. I want to encourage you to download it. It's a free MP3 file, a free audio book. Listen to it, and if it resonates with you, send it to a friend. Send it to a family member. Who's in your world? Just like in my world, who's not yet got the revelation about Jesus that you have? Anyway, so I sent her a letter, you know, eventually, in what God showed me. But I want to take you back then to that prayer time, kneeling by my bed and having this quite lengthy conversation with the Lord about why did Jesus have to come? Why the gory, bloody details? I want to show you this real quick. You may have heard this this last week. There's a rapper. See, the blood, the blood is a big thing. The gory, bloody details, it's a big thing, the blood. People intuitively know the power of the blood, but the only blood loaded with God's eternal, redemptive, and life-giving power is the blood of Jesus. But this last week, a rapper decided he was going to take 666 pairs of Nikes and redo the bottoms and put a drop of human blood in the soles, a pentagram on top, and then just to mock God, Luke 10:18, embroider Luke 10:18 on the side. And they're going on sale March 29th for over $1,000 a pair. Now, if that isn't a commentary on the culture we're in and the need for Christians to understand the gospel and the power of the one and only blood, I don't know what is. And all the people said, the devil hates the blood. The blood is what defeated him. So let's find out why the gory, bloody details. So, kneeling by the bed, I'm like, okay, Lord, you know, help me, help me explain this to my cousin. So, like, what do I know? What came to me right away is, well, I know this. I know Hebrews 9.22. I knew Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. I knew that was true. It's in Hebrews. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Okay, but why? 
Still, why? Why was that the way? In other words, we'll revisit here in just a minute when Adam and Eve fell in the garden and God had to, you know, do something about the, the sin problem, the fall of man. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, but why that way? Why was it the shedding of blood? Why couldn't, I want you to think about this with me, why couldn't God have redeemed man, forgiven sin, fixed the fall of man? Why couldn't God have done this whole thing that we're going to celebrate next week, Easter? Why couldn't he have done this some other way? Why couldn't God have said to mankind, hey, guys, we're going to have a problem here, but I've got it worked out. The way we're going to fix the problem is if you as a human just do 100 good deeds a week, then your, the balance sheet will look good. You'll be fine. Sin's forgiven. Just do 100 good deeds a week. Or why couldn't he have said, Here, here's the thing, just be a good person. Just be a good person. The cutoff, you know, for good to bad, the cutoff is going to be somewhere around a D, D plus. Just be a good person, and then I'll forgive all your sins. Why couldn't he have done that? Why couldn't he have said, hey, guys, here's the thing. You're just going to have to give more money to my kingdom, and then you can pay your way in, and we'll call it good. Why couldn't he have done it with money? Why couldn't he have done it and said, I'm going to give you a password. And those who know the password, punch it in when you get to heaven. Just punch it in. That's going to be the way. That your sins are forgiven and you're saved. Why did God have to go with the gory, bloody details? Why, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness? I mean, literally, think about it. Why wasn't there some other way? He's God. Couldn't he have done it any way he wanted? Let's look at it. Go over to Genesis. I'm kneeling by the bed. I'm asking him these questions. Lord, why the blood? He said, go back to Genesis with me. So kneeling by the bed, I opened up my Bible, and I started reading in Genesis. And I got to Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Jump down to verse 15. Then the Lord God put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So we see here in the story of creation, God creates Adam and Eve, puts them in a garden. We see a couple of things. First, we see that to create Adam, the Bible says God took dirt, formed him from the dust of the earth. God grabbed some dirt, some clay, a bunch of it, apparently, grabbed some clay, and he sculpted a statue. God sculpted Adam from a hunk of dirt. He was just a statue. He was a, he was a 3D statue. There were no organs, there was no heart, there was no brain. It was just dirt. It was just dirt through and through. The Bible says, then God breathed into the nostrils of a statue, and man became a living soul. God breathed what? Life. God breathed life. Now, then we know later God took a rib out of Adam, fashioned Eve, much more delicate, much more artistic, fashioned Eve, and it was nothing but life. It was life, 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 nothing but life. And he said, I'm going to put you in a garden, the Garden of Eden, and the Garden of Eden, by definition, it means a, a garden of pleasures, like a great place. Like God created the earth for man. God created the universe for the earth, the galaxy for the earth, the universe for the galaxy. I mean, God loves man. God loves you. God loves me. God loved Adam and Eve. He put them in this garden, and now this Garden of Eden is and was a physical location on earth. You could get Google Earth out and see it. You could GPS it. It's a place on earth. Now, scholars have been trying to figure out where. Where was the Garden of Eden? They know it was in the Middle East somewhere, and they know certain rivers were eventually ran into it. However, the Bible says... 
in Peter that the world that then was, the pre-Noah flood world that then was, was overcome with water and completely rearranged. Earth as we know it is not the same exactly. I mean, there's certain pieces that are, but not the same exactly as the earth that then was. Because the earth that then was, after Noah's flood, changed dramatically. So they don't really know. They can't pinpoint where the Garden of Eden was, but they can pinpoint a large geographic area, the Middle East, where a couple of rivers run together. He puts them in a garden. It's resounding life. It's green. It's lush. The best gold, the Bible says, is in that garden. All these rivers are in that garden. And God says to Adam and Eve, guard the garden, keep the garden. I've given you authority. Have dominion on the earth over every creeping thing, over everything that flies, over everything on the earth. Adam and Eve, you are my representatives. I've imparted life into you. Rule and reign. Live the life. He said, but just one thing, just one thing don't do. Just one commandment, don't do. Don't, don't disobey this one. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's two trees in the garden, right? You guys know that? The, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. He said, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the tree of life, as soon as they did eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God had to put angels in front of it with swords to not allow them to even go near the tree of life. Because had they gone to the tree of life after they disobeyed eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would have remained dead, separated from God for eternity. He protected them from themselves. Who's glad the Lord still does that sometimes? For you and I. Protects us from ourselves. He said to them, don't eat, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because in the day that you eat of it, you will die. What did God want? He wanted life, 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 life. That's all he wanted. It's no wonder when Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament, he's like, hey, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. It's always been God's plan. Life has always been his plan, abundant life, the God kind of life. The whole Bible, and I saw this as I'm kneeling by my bed, I saw the whole Bible is really a story of death and life. Life and death. It's the whole story of the Bible. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So you guys know the story. So Adam and Eve have this incredible option, rule and reign in the garden. Eve goes by the tree of life one day, or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil one day. She sees the fruit. Nobody knows for sure what the fruit was, but, you know, traditionally it's an apple. She sees the apple, and she thinks, ooh, that looks good. It's pretty. It's good to my eyes. It looks good for taste. It'll make me wise. Like, that's a good fruit. And she's thinking about taking a bite. But then she says, no, God said, don't eat the fruit. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, along comes a serpent. Now, back in the day, in the beginning of creation, when everything resounded life, Here's this serpent. Back in the day, serpents didn't slither on their stomach. That came after the curse. They were upright. Snakes that walked. How's that make you feel? And not only that, they talked. A talking snake that walks came up to Adam and Eve, or came up to Eve in this case, and said, Hey, Eve, how's it going? It's going good. Boy, that fruit looks good. I know. That's what I'm thinking. But God said we shouldn't eat it. Then the devil did, the serpent, the snake, did exactly what he still does. He came at her with three lies, in essence. Basically, hath God said, come on, Eve, has God said that? You believe God's words? Let's get relevant, honey. Let's get up to date. Hath God said? Did God really say that? Is that really in the Bible? And then he went on to say, well, you know, the only reason God said that, Eve, is because he doesn't want you to eat the fruit because he knows if you eat it, you'll be like him, and he's so insecure. Be your own man. Be your own woman. You be the boss of you, Eve. Same lies. Then as now. 
And Eve listened, and she's like, yeah, you know, you're right. The Bible says she then took the fruit. She ate it. She gave it to her husband. He ate it. And in that moment, they died. Now, they didn't die physically. They actually didn't die physically for another, get this, for another 930 years. They lived to be 930. That's how much life, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, that's how much life was in Adam and Eve at the beginning. And had they never eaten the fruit, they would have lived forever because there was no death. But God said, in the day that you eat of it, in that day, you will surely die. They took a bite, and in that instant, they died. How do we know? Well, we know from a lot of things, but one thing we know for sure. It was just a few short hours later. They're in the garden in the cool of the day, twilight, and there was a habit where God would come into the garden to fellowship with Adam and Eve, and they'd have a communion together, and they had a great relationship, and they're blessed, and they have a wonderful uh, communion is about the best word I can say. It's more than just like friendship. It's a communion. They're close. God comes into the garden that day, and he's looking around, and he's like, Adam, Adam, where are you? Now, of course, God knew where he was, but he needed Adam to now understand what had happened. Adam and Eve were hiding. The Bible says they were hiding. They were naked and ashamed. They were hiding. They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. For the first time ever, shame and guilt and inferiority and condemnation, it entered the planet. It had not been there. It had only been life and blessing and goodness and love. All of a sudden, they're hiding from God. Why? Death entered. Adam, where are you? So now we have a crisis in the garden. We have a crisis in the garden. God only wanted life, and now we have death. God loves those he created, but now death has lodged in the spirit of man. Death has come to the earth. Now what? Well, here's one option. One option, I don't know, maybe if you and I were God, maybe this is how we do it. One option is do over. That would be a good option. Just wipe out Adam and Eve. Start over. We got a flaw in the mold. Can't we just start over? Do we have to keep going with this situation now that mankind has been infected by sin? Do we have to keep going down this road? Why can't we do a do-over? Or why can't God do some of the other things we mentioned? Okay, God, they blew it. Death is entered, but can we just overcome death with some good, good deeds? Can we pay some money and overcome death? Can we get a password? Can I buy a vowel? Can I do anything? To overcome death. I'm praying. I'm by my bed praying, having this whole conversation with the Lord. In Romans 5, 12, we kind of went here, the Lord and I. Lord, you have a death situation. Mankind is dead on arrival. I'm thinking, God, how do you get the paddles? You've got to get the paddles into humanity. How do you do it? This is what I'm thinking. Romans 5, 12 Mankind went from life, connected to God, to death, spiritually separated from God. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Let me talk about this for a minute, because you might be thinking like I did, Lord, it's not fair. It was just Adam and Eve that sinned. It wasn't all of us. They were the ones. They're the bad ones, you know. Well, the truth is, and of course, the Scripture tells us, all of us would have done the same thing. That sin nature entered into Adam and Eve. They sinned, and then death, as a result of sin, passed to all men. Not because God was unfair, but because of that last line, for that all have sinned. All of us have sinned. The Bible says, all have sinned. Everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's where that recognition of, I'm a sinner. Holy smokes, I thought I was good. I am a good person, but I'm not good enough. 
All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Death has passed to all men. Now, death doesn't mean physical death. There's three different kinds of death described in the Bible, but let me tell you what we're talking about, spiritual death. Adam and Eve didn't die for another 930 years, but they did die spiritually that day. Spiritual death is a separation. You've got to get this. You've got to get it so that you understand it, but also so that you can explain this to your family and friends. Spiritual death is the problem because of sin. Spiritual death is this. God had a relationship with Adam and Eve. They were communing. They were joined together, enjoying life together. Sin entered in, and as a result of sin, death came. Death, spiritual death, is a separation. They are now separated from God. That's why God said, Adam, where are you? They're separated. They are dead spiritually. And if this does not get rectified... They will stay in this condition for eternity. This is also our condition before we come to Christ. We also are dead as a result of sin. We are separated from God. This is our condition. And if we don't get this rectified before we leave planet Earth, we stay in this condition separated from God for eternity in a place called hell. Not because God is mean, not because, oh, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? I don't like hell. I know. I don't either. But if we are spiritually separated from God, this is how we will remain for eternity. Death has passed to all men, for all have sinned. Critical. This is a critical crisis. We have a death crisis. You think COVID was a pandemic. This was a global, eternal pandemic. But I'm so glad that God's on the job. Always. 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 So I'm praying, Lord, okay, I get it. We have a death situation. It's a crisis. You just wanted life, but now there's death. How are we going to fix it? How are we going to remedy the situation? So I had like a logical thought. My logical thought was, okay, what overcomes death? I'm having that thought, kneeling by the bed. What overcomes death? And I'm like, okay, good deeds don't overcome death. Money doesn't overcome death. A password doesn't overcome death. Like if there's a dead person in a casket, you don't go up to them and say, hey, I'll give you money. Come alive. You don't give them a password. Like, it doesn't overcome death. I'm like, Lord, what overcomes death? Like, well, the only thing that overcomes death is life. It's the only thing that overcomes death is life. I said, okay, God, you have a, you have a, a death situation on the planet, and the only thing that will overcome that is life. So you basically needed to get life back into the situation. You needed to inject life back into mankind. How? How are you going to do that? He took me over as I'm kneeling there. He prompted, he reminded me of Leviticus 17.11. Opened up my Bible, went to Leviticus 17.11. Where could God find life to overcome the death that now lodged in the human race? Leviticus 17.11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. There's life in the blood. Where's life? You need life to overcome death. Where can we find some life? Life is in the blood. There's life in the blood. Okay. Yay. I'm thinking, okay, Lord, so, so whose blood? Who's got the blood that has the life? I start going through the list. Because not only do you need blood with life, you need eternal life. We don't want to repeat this situation. We need to get eternal life. I said, okay, who's, who's eternal and who's got blood? Kneeling by the bed. Who's eternal? Who's got blood? Okay, man, man is eternal. Humans, we're eternal. We have blood, but our blood is contaminated because death has spread. 
to all man. Our blood can't be used. The life is in the blood. Our blood is disqualified. Okay, who else has eternal or blood? Okay, plants. Plants are temporal. And plants don't have blood. Okay? Angels. Angels are eternal. But angels don't have blood. Lord, you just need some blood. You just need some eternal blood. Who's got some blood? Okay, let's see. Animals. Animals have blood. But they're temporary. Ugh, rats. In the Old Testament, for a season, God was willing to use animal sacrifices. Their temporary blood was shed because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Their blood was shed to make an atonement, to cover sin, so that God could have a life-giving relationship with the Israelites. He covered the death as a result of sin by the temporary blood of animals. Bulls and goats and lambs, the spotless lamb every year, the high priest would sacrifice the blood of one spotless lamb, cover the sins of the people for one year. Animals, ah, rats, can't use them long term. Who else? Who else is eternal? Who else has blood? I said, God, you're eternal, but you don't have blood. Man, if only, if only God could become a man. If only God, who is eternal, could become a human who has blood. Wow, wouldn't that be something? Then you'd have eternal, life-filled blood in the veins of somebody that wasn't disqualified. Man, if only that could happen. Cue the Virgin Mary. The Lord appears to a little gal named Mary, the, uh, experts say 12, 13, 14 years old. Sweet little Mary, loves the Lord, good girl. One day she's in her bedroom checking her Facebook and voila, Gabriel shows up. Hey Mary, you are highly favored. God picked you. He looked across the whole planet, Mary, and he saw you and he picked you. And here's what's going to happen. I know you're engaged to Joseph. We'll deal with that. The Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. And the power of the Most High is going to come upon you. And you're going to conceive a baby in your womb, and you're going to name him Jesus, and he's going to be the Savior of the whole world, Mary. And Mary, she has no idea about the blood. She doesn't even know about the blood, the spotless, the sinless, the death, the life. She doesn't know all that. All she knows is, I love God. And her words to him were, be it unto me according to your word. That's the best response, isn't it? Best response when the Lord comes to you and I and he speaks some things to us that we don't really want to hear, we don't really understand, we don't fully get. Seems like it's going to mess up my engagement. And her response, she was not a rebel. She didn't have to have everything explained. She was not a rebellious teenager. She just said, be it unto me, according to your word. Amen. And the Bible says, that which was conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now she's pregnant. She's pregnant with the Savior of the whole world. For all eternity past and all eternity future, she has a baby in her womb. And that baby in his veins has blood. And the blood that he has is eternal because he's God. It is spotless and sinless because he's God. And it's qualified to be the kind of blood that would need to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. The kind of blood that if it were shed, the life is in the blood and it could overcome the death crisis. Amen. So she has to get full term. Mary has to get to full term. Got to deliver this baby. The Bible talks about how we have a treasure in these earthen vessels. You and I do. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We have a treasure in earthen vessels. We don't even understand fully the treasure we have. But Mary, for sure, 
had a treasure in her earthen vessel. And it's just unbelievable, really, when you think about it. God has been working a master plan all these years. Now there's a baby in a womb. The baby has the blood. And here's the thing. Those of you mothers just had a baby. Those of you that understand when you're pregnant, your circulatory system is completely separate from the baby's. There's a placenta, but their circulatory system is completely separate from yours. They can have a different type of blood. Blood type can be different than yours. Isn't that smart of the Lord? Wasn't that wise of God to set the whole thing up so that it would work such that he could send a redeemer with the blood? He's born. The ironic thing is they can't get a room the night of his birth. I mean, the devil fought. He didn't fully know everything. The devil didn't know everything, but he was listening to prophetic things, and he, he knew some things. He certainly did try to stop it all, didn't he? But God prevails. Jesus is born in a manger, and then he has to get to the cross. Now, here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus has to live a spotless, sinless life. He's born, yay! He's got blood in his veins, praise God. But that blood has to ultimately be shed. And here's the thing about Jesus. He was the only begotten son. I don't know if I read this verse. Let me read it just so you can see it one more time. A verse you know, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. See, now we've just switched from life to eternal life. That was the plan. The plan was an eternal redemption. And Jesus was the only begotten son of the Father. Here's what's important. And this is why when we worship Jesus, we, we should. He is the one. He's the only one. He's the only begotten son. It wasn't like God was in heaven saying to Jesus, okay, Jesus, here's the deal. You go first. Let's see if you can do it. Let's put some blood in your veins. Let's get you on earth. Let's see if you can be the savior of the whole world. If it doesn't work out, I've got a few other sons up here. We'll send another. No, Jesus was the one and only. He was plan A and plan Z. Jesus was the plan. Amen. So Jesus is walking on earth. Now, you have to get this because I think sometimes we miss it. We think, oh, well, the reason he could do everything is because he's God. He's God in the flesh. He could just do it. And all. Yes, 100% he is God. 100%. But the Bible tells us he set aside his God advantage. Everything Jesus did on the earth that you and I read about in the Bible, everything he did on the earth, walking on water, multiplying loaves and fishes, healing people, going to the cross, everything he did on the earth, he did it as a man empowered by the Holy Spirit. He set aside his God advantage. He humbled himself. He became a man, though he was God. He did not consider equality with God something to be comprehended. He set that aside because he knew he had to do what he did as a man to be a just substitute for us. He had to do what he did as a man, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Interestingly, that's how you and I are supposed to live. As Christian people, Christ in us, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So it even puts more, to me, more praise and honor to Jesus that he lived 33 years on earth never sinning. And he didn't do it because he was God. He did it as a man. He resisted temptation. He was tempted in every way, just like we are, and yet he never sinned. That's amazing. 33 years, he never once sinned, and he couldn't sin because if he ever sinned, his blood is contaminated. And then all is lost. There's no other redeemer to send. That's it. Sorry, mankind, you're stuck now in a death spiral for eternity. So when Jesus would say things, I don't do anything of myself, but only what I see my Father do and what I hear him say, I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, only the will of my Father who sent me. I hope it makes you love the Lord. It makes me love the Lord more. Jesus, you did this for us. He lives his sinless life, but, he, but it wasn't just enough to live the sinless life. He's got to get to the cross. It's the blood. 
Look at this in 1 Peter 1. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. That's Adam and Eve. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. Instead, it was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. Interestingly, tucked in that passage there, Jesus was the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. Even before Adam and Eve were created, God had a master plan, a rescue plan, a redemption plan, a salvation plan. He was going to send a redeemer to save us even before we sinned. Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain, already slain. He wasn't even born yet. He was slain from the foundations of the world. This precious blood. You know, I was thinking about my dad, and um, my dad's in heaven now. And um, when he passed away, my sisters and I had to, you know, take care of all of his effects. And we went down to uh, Tampa area where he lived, and he was buried in the Veterans Cemetery there in uh, St. Petersburg, right? St. Petersburg. And, um, you know, funerals are never, they're just always weird, different. And, you know, he was, and my father was cremated. Many people, you know, obviously have done that. It was one of those things, you know, those surreal moments, because my sisters and I and a few other people that were at this particular service had to carry the, the canister, those of you that have been down this road, you know, it's kind of gruesome. But we got to talk about this stuff because this life on earth is a fleeting vapor. We're carrying a, a canister, maybe 24 inches long, I don't know, maybe 8 inches around. It's a canister with ashes. It's it. And you're going to go have a service and you're going to, they dug a, dug a little tunnel hole thing and we're going to put this canister, ashes, in the ground. Four feet down, they do for cremation. Four feet down. And you're thinking, man, if this is all there is, what a ripoff. If this life is all there is, what a ripoff. Because if, if, if you live your life and you're large and in charge and you golf and you own a business and you have a bunch of kids and a bunch of grandkids and you, you do all your stuff and then it all ends in a canister four feet under. It's a farce. But my dad told my, my sisters and I, we went to hospice with him. This is a funny story i got to tell you real quick. We went to hospice with him. My dad, we came to visit. My dad said, I want your girls to take me to hospice. I want to meet the people that are going to take care of me in that time. He knew he had just a few months to go. And we're like, Dad, I don't think people do that. He's like, let's just go. I want to go. So we go to the hospice place. We walk in. Hello. And, of course, they're very, you know, they're very um, sober and, you know, nice. How can we help you? Did you lose a loved one? Do you have someone that is terminal? My dad goes, it's me. <laughs> And they kind of jolted, you know. He goes, yeah, he goes, I'm going to probably be coming here in a couple of weeks. Maybe a couple of months. I just want to meet everybody. Just kind of want to know what's going to happen. For real. And they kind of looked at him like, I don't think anybody's ever done this before. And my dad said, he goes, well, I won't stay long. <laughs> you know why he could do all that? You know why he could do all that? And you know why the canister thing doesn't really bother us? I'll tell you why. Because my dad knew for sure where he was going. He knew Jesus. He knew for sure, 100%. And the reason I'm telling you this story, we said, Dad, what would you like on your tombstone? What would you like on your stone that's going to be there? He said, I just want two words, just two words, you know, my name and birth and date of death and all that. Two words. What two words? Blood bought. That's it. Blood bought. Blood bought. The precious blood of the Lamb enabled us to transfer. Look at this verse. 
in Revelations 5, verse 9. Jesus is the all-time hero and champion of all ages. He had the blood. You are worthy because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. This is for everybody. It's not just an American gospel. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every language. It's the blood. It's the blood. We're in a death spiral, separated from God. Death reigns. And then Jesus comes on the scene with the blood to reunite us, reconcile us to the Father. Amen. Look at this verse in uh, John 5. What's our response? Okay, now you're watching online today, hopefully. You're here in the room. What's our response? You say, I don't know. I don't know what would happen to me if I'm in a canister. I don't know where I'm going for eternity. It scares the living daylights out of me. I was scared to die from the time I was six years old. I remember. I lost a cousin. He was three. And I remember the first time I went to a funeral, it was his. And it scared me. What happens? Where do people go for eternity? What happens? But then, see, once Jesus becomes the Lord of your life, once you respond the way we're going to share in just a moment, everything changes. You go from being dead in sins and trespasses to being reconciled to God and alive. You leave death and you get life. This is what Jesus said about it. Jesus made a way for us to cross from death to life. John 5, 24. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word. Is that you today out there online? Whoever hears my word. Is that you here in the room? Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. You cross over. You can cross over. Listen, if you've invited Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, if you've already done that, the minute you did that, just like when Adam and Eve fell and got the death sentence the minute they sinned, the minute you received Jesus, in that instant, you passed. You crossed over from death to life. You cross over from death to life. You have life, eternal life within you. And the truth is you'll never die. Your body will die. But you, the real person behind your eyeballs, no, you will never die. You might be in a hospice situation someday. And you may close your eyes laying in a bed someday. And it'll be a blink. You'll go, she gone. But she's not gone. He's not gone. You open your eyes. I'm in heaven. What's going on? Whoa. I never died. The real you will never die. Never. You've already passed. You've already crossed that bridge, y'all. You will never die. Amen. All right. Last but not least, I want to pray a prayer because if you are here and you've never received Jesus personally, you've never become a Christian You just have to accept and understand we're all sinners in need of a Savior. No matter how good we might be, we're not good enough. But here's what it says in Romans. You can apply the blood. The blood applied. Romans 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You can be saved today, watching there online, here in the room. You can be saved today. How? How can I be saved? How can I pass from death to life? It's what you believe in your heart. Do you believe Jesus is who he said he was? Do you believe God sent Jesus, his son, to this earth? Do you believe God raised him from the dead? Do you believe? Part A. Part B. Confess with your mouth. Say it with your mouth. Say it loud enough for God to hear it. I confess with my mouth. I'm saying it with my mouth for all to hear. Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. That's how you get saved. That's how you leave the death crisis and you receive eternal life and begin what God intended for you all along. Amen. On Good Friday, the gory, bloody details happened for you and I. So that on Easter Sunday, 
when he was raised from the dead, we too could be raised to new life. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. It makes me love the Lord. I hope it makes you love the Lord. Let's pray. If you're here, you've never prayed that salvation prayer, let's make sure we do that, okay? Say it with me. Say, dear God, louder, dear God, I do believe in your son, Jesus Christ. And today I want heaven to record, Jesus be the Lord of my life. I confess, I surrender from this moment forward. I want to live for you. Help me to be the person you wanted me to be all along in fellowship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.